What would you do if you were in high school and they made you go into the battlefield to take care of wounded soldiers? Himeyuri translates to Princess Lily. It refers to the white lily flower, which people associate with purity and rejuvenation. This white flower would be painted red in the Battle of Okinawa in World War II. The year was 1945, and the fighting in the Pacific was heading towards the main Japanese islands. Allied forces wanted to use the island of Okinawa as a base for a land invasion of the main Japanese islands. The Japanese Imperial Army was hell bent on stopping them at Okinawa, so they sent a bunch of troops to the island to prepare for the coming battle. The army took over schools, and school hours were reduced as they taught the students how to be of use in battle. That's right, students. When I was in high school, the biggest thing I had to deal with was wondering whether or not Allison liked me when she sat next to me at lunch and ate food off my plate. She didn't. She was just poor and hungry. They taught boys things like fixing bridges and running supplies. They taught girls a crash course in nursing. Now the stories these girls told about what they went through were amazing. Pretty sure this video will be demonetized because YouTube likes to do that to every single video about World War II. But I was researching this and I couldn't wait to talk about it. To be fair, we do go into some heavy stuff. On March 23rd, 1945, the Japanese military organized high school students from the top two all-girls schools in Okinawa into a medical unit. They were called the Himeyuri Student Corps, and their symbol was the white lily. 222 high school girls and 18 teachers marched to a field hospital in a town called Haibaru. There was actually an additional 79 students and 3 teachers from other schools, but they were assigned to other units. The students were all 15 to 19 years old. So these girls all thought that going to a hospital meant going to a clean, well-kept building fully stocked with sterile equipment and medicine. You know, a typical hospital. When they got there, it was literally a cave. The field hospital was a whole network of caves dug into the mountains. Halls of dirt and rock around six feet high, often lit by candles. The girls got in and got ready. But none of them were ready. On April 1st, 1945, a ground force of U.S. Army and Marines landed on Okinawa and the surrounding islands, kicking off the Battle of Okinawa. It would be later called the Typhoon of Steel, the last battle in the Pacific, and the most bloody. Imagine being in high school, some girls were barely in high school, and being thrust into a war zone. These were upper-class high school students. They probably had never seen a dead body before. They waited in their caves. Some were scared, some were excited to serve their country and their emperor. When the fighting began, the wounded started pouring in. Horror came with them. Military doctors ordered the girls around to help with this and that. Take care of this soldier, feed that soldier, pick maggots from that other soldier's dying flesh. I'll be reading a lot of testimonies from these girls because man, their words are brutal. They really give you a sense of what these high school girls went through. Yabiku Toshiko 17. The stench was unbearable, so it was almost impossible to nurse the wounded or tend to their wounds. I can still hear the cries and shrieks of those soldiers in the throes of death during surgical operations. It was hell itself. We didn't have enough anesthetic, so doctors administered it just enough to ease their patient's tension. One patient begged desperately, That's enough! Doctor, kill me! Just kill me now! Shut up! You can't put up with this much pain! You're a Japanese soldier, aren't you? The surgeon shouted at him. By mid-May, you could tell the condition of the patients had gotten really bad. All of them were smeared with pus and lice crawled all over their bodies. The number of brain fever and tetanus patients rapidly increased. Completely deranged brain fever patients were really terrible. They'd suddenly stand up and start walking, trampling seriously wounded soldiers lying in the cave. All the while, the battle happened around them. Remember, they weren't in some green zone away from the fighting. They were right in the middle of it. The bombs and gunshots rang right outside their caves. Even so, the smell of rotting flesh and bodily fluids was so strong that many of the girls risked leaving the cave's protection anyway when they had the chance just to escape the stench. Yabiku Toshiko again. Tetanus patients developed cramps in their legs and arms, finally getting lockjaw. When they reached that point, they could no longer even eat the cream of rice gruel. Such patients were taken to a narrow isolation ward, enclosed by wooden shutters. They kept their eyes wide open and just stared at us, as if to implore us to get them out of there. 
Food was an issue. There wasn't much. No meat, vegetables, rarely. They mostly had rice, so they made rice balls, onigiri, for the soldiers and themselves. The food situation got so bad, soldiers would beg for them to cook amputated limbs for food. They didn't do it, that I know of. Speaking of amputations, there was a lot of that, too. Kishimoto Hisa, 17. I held down the arm a doctor was going to cut off and encouraged the patient to endure. That was really frightening. The amputated hand still clutched my hand. Surgery without anesthetic was common. For an operation on the shoulder, a soldier was told to sit in a chair. He was a sergeant who had been shot through his shoulder. He was operated on without any anesthesia. His muscles were cut about 3 centimeters deep and 10 centimeters long, with a special pair of scissors in about 10 cuts. He didn't scream, but his brow was sweating and tears streamed down his face. I tried to hold his hand, but he wouldn't let me. Instead, he held his own hand to bear the pain. For two months, the Himeyuri students did their jobs. Most girls said they stopped having their periods because of stress and bad nutrition. And the bugs. Oh god, the insects and maggots and all kinds of things with too many legs. Imagine sleeping in those caves. It was clear the battle was not going their way. Then, on May 25th, 1945, the girls and everyone else in that field hospital were ordered to evacuate the caves. The enemy was coming, and they had to retreat south. Everyone packed their things and left the safety of the caves. Well, not everyone. Those who couldn't walk, including students, were poisoned. Why? Maybe to help them escape the pain, but also maybe to prevent them from divulging information to the U.S. forces. So the soldiers, students, and teachers moved out in the open, hiding behind what little cover was left after the constant firebombing. They were in the midst of the bullets now. They headed south, moving from cave to cave, and these brave girls kept doing their jobs caring for the wounded. Luckily, it was an area with many caves, but that was probably the only luck they had with them. On June 18th, when defeat was inevitable, the Japanese Imperial Army disbanded the Himeyuri. They were free from their service. But free to do what? Where would they go? Well, that was their problem, because the soldiers forced them out of the caves. The caves were overcrowded, and they were for the Imperial Army, not civilians. Now you may be saying, what the hell, that's a dick move, cave soldiers. These girls took care of you and worked alongside you for months, and now you just kick them out? Well, you see, it was a military operation, and you don't want civilians hanging around. Yeah, you're right, it was a huge dick move. This actually happened a lot. There were civilians on the island, and many of them hid from the fighting in their own caves. There were reports of Japanese soldiers kicking Okinawan civilians out from their caves so the soldiers themselves could use them or hide in them. However, we do know of one report that a Japanese doctor chased some of the girls out of his cave because he feared for their safety. The Americans were about to raid his cave. Anyways, the students were released into the battlefield. No military escort, no weapons. And now things get worse. Shockingly, up until this point, not many of the girls died. They were in caves and were under military protection. There were student deaths, of course. We don't know the number, but apparently it wasn't that many. That would change. Surrender was forbidden for loyal subjects of the emperor. The girls were even told that they would be tortured or worse by the Americans if they surrendered. So the girls had to navigate the battlefield and find their own shelters. This is when most of the deaths happened. The official count was 219, which is clearly wrong because we know of many more survivors than that would suggest. Someone smarter than me went ahead and combed through the text and arrived at 123. The actual number was probably around there, which is still a lot. There were soldiers who helped some of the girls out. Miyagi Toyo, 20 years old, tells us about one. Two soldiers happened to pass by, so we told them we were looking for refuge and asked if they could take us to a cave. When we got there, an Okinawan man and a boy, about 14 or 15, apparently his son, were sitting at the entrance of the cave. Suddenly, one of the soldiers started shouting at the father and son, brandishing his sword at them. Anyone who does not obey military orders, I'll cut him down, he growled. In other words, he was trying to drive them out of the cave in order to make room for us. The four of us were really frightened and said to the soldier, Please, soldier, we don't want to get in the cave by driving them out. But the frightened father and son jumped out of the cave and ran away before we knew it. Some groups were less fortunate. Kaneshiro Kikoku, 16. 
We stuck to Taira Sensei and kept on fleeing along the shore. By then our group had been reduced to 12. Enemy ships would come close to the shore, broadcasting calls to surrender. Americans will protect you. Come aboard as soon as possible. We could see their faces clearly. That made us even more scared. Tanks were approaching with flamethrowers. I felt more dead than alive. Taira Sensei, let's die before it's too late, some demanded. Sensei, let's do it immediately, others prodded the teacher. Taira Sensei looked quite disturbed because he, as our teacher, had the responsibility to protect our lives and was determined to do so. I had a hand grenade he had given me. The story of Kaneshiro Kikoku's group is heartbreaking. Someone suggested that they sing to cheer themselves up. So the kids sang, but the singing quickly devolved into crying. The Americans kept calling for them to surrender through their loudspeaker. The girls saw a Japanese soldier raise his hands and walk to shore, right before getting shot. Later on, an American soldier found them and fired into the group. Taira Sensei took the grenade and ran into a cave where nine of the students hid. Out of mercy, he pulled the pin from the grenade and killed himself and all nine girls. Now, I don't want to paint American soldiers as all terrible. One girl talked about an American soldier who gave her water and helped her to safety, even though she thought he was going to kill her. The Battle of Okinawa ended on June 22nd, 1945, three months of the bloodiest fighting in the Pacific. Even when the news came around that the battle was lost, some girls showed their devotion to the emperor by refusing to surrender. But eventually, they all did. Thing is, the nightmare was not over. 100,000 soldiers were put in concentration camps. Janice Suetomi, still alive today, said that her camp was dirty and did not have enough food. So many people died from malaria and starvation that they had to bury them in large graves. Janice herself would have died of malaria if it wasn't for a soldier who took care of her. She reunited with her family afterwards and went back home. Unfortunately, their house was occupied by strangers who refused to let them in. They said it was wartime, and there's no such thing as a home that's yours anymore. She and her family had to live in a barn for a time before the people in their house finally left. I could probably make a whole video where I just read the words of these high school students. They're that compelling. What really killed me was finding out that before it all started, the girls thought that they would be called on to help out for a few days, then go back to school. The girls didn't want to fall behind in class, so they brought books and school supplies with them to study and do homework. Something about seeing a student's backpack in the middle of a cave of dead and dying soldiers, jeez. Back during the battle, there was a cave where a group of 51 students and teachers hid. 46 of them died in a bombing. Today, the Himeyuri Peace Museum sits at that very spot to remind us of the horrors and sacrifice of these high school girls and teachers. In the museum, there's a room with pictures of all the Himeyuri girls who lost their lives. Looking at them, it really hits home that these were just kids, put in a situation that kids should never be put in. Woof, alright, this was a serious video. What do you guys think? If you liked it, consider throwing a few bucks to my Patreon. It's information that you keep for your entire life. Isn't that worth the value of a cup of coffee? I want to thank our new patron this week, Danielle Bissonette. Thanks, Danielle. You're the best. All right, much love, you guys, and spread the knowledge.